in listen only mode. Hi everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on evaluating the fetus at risk for shoulder dystocia, presented by Dr. Gregory DeVore. At the end of this webinar, participants should be able to define shoulder dystocia, identify its causes, and discuss management. Participants should also be able to define macrosomia and list tools to predict adverse outcomes. The AIUM is accredited by the ACCME. This webinar is designated for one AMA PRA Category 1 credit. Credits for this webinar are approved for physicians, sonographers, and radiologic technologists. Participants who complete the post-test with a grade of 70% or higher will be awarded one CME credit. As an ACCME accredited provider, it is the AIUM's policy to ensure that the contents and quality of this activity are balanced, independent, objective, and scientifically rigorous. All individuals who are in a position to control the content of an educational activity are required to complete a disclosure form. All disclosures are reviewed by the AIUM and any conflicts of interest are resolved or managed prior to an activity. Dr. DeVore has no disclosures. AIUM staff members and individuals involved with planning this activity have no disclosures. During today's presentation, if you have questions for the presenter, you may type them into the question box on the right side of your screen. You will be able to submit questions throughout this webinar, but the presenter will not begin answering until the end of the presentation, at which time he will answer as many questions as possible. A recording of this webinar will be available on the AIUM website. And now, we're pleased to present Dr. Gregory DeVore. Okay, can you hear me? Sounds good, Dr. DeVore. Thank you. Okay, fine. Ready to go. And, okay. Well, it's a pleasure to be able to spend 45 to 50 minutes with you and discuss the topic evaluating the fetus at risk for shoulder dystocia. This lecture was derived from a need in our local community to understand the principles associated with macrosomia and shoulder dystocia, so it, it was developed from a clinical uh, problem and a need. Hold up just a second here. What we're going to do is, the agenda will be as follows. We're going to define macrosomia, the ultrasound estimation of fetal weight, prediction of fetal weight at term, definitions of shoulder dystocia, causes of shoulder dystocia, management of shoulder dystocia, and tools to predict the adverse outcome associated with shoulder dystocia. This will include the cheek-to-cheek -cheek diameter, the abdominal diameter to, uh, to BPD uh, ratio, and, the brachial, and also discuss brachial plexus injury. So we're going to cover a lot of topics, and what I'm going to do is lay a foundation so that, uh, as I'm assuming that you know nothing about this topic, and then we're going to lay a foundation and explore the topic and also provide solutions to help you as you scan patients who may be at risk for this condition. Now, it's interesting, the American College of OBGYN uh, published uh, data in a technical bulletin in 1996, and they defined the incidence or the, the percentiles for, for fetal weight based upon gestational age from 37 to 42 weeks. They then, of course, calculated the 50th percentile, 90th percentile, 95th percentile. Now, in ultrasound parlance, we often discuss weights above the 90th percentile or below the 10th percentile. But as you'll see, ACOG, for example, when they when they created these these uh, this table, 
they define macrosomia for the diabetic uh, patient as an estimated fetal weight above 4,500 grams. You can see it's well above the 95th percentile. And for non-diabetics, 5,000 grams. And so the threshold is quite high for quote-unquote macrosomia. But the question, of course, can be posed, do we act based upon these numbers or are there other tools or other ways of evaluating the fetus is at risk for shoulder dystocia and complications using some other techniques. So let's look now at some concepts that are important. We all know that based upon the definition I just showed you, that an estimated fetal weight it would be an appropriate tool to consider to define the fetus at high risk. Now using the Hadlock equation, uh, and there are several of them, there's four different iterations of Hadlock's, Hadlock's equation for, for assessing weight, we see that if you look at the, the percent difference between what the weight is estimated to be and the actual birth weight, for fetuses over 4,000 grams, there's an 8.6% difference between uh, the actual weight and the uh, estimated weight with ultrasound. So Hadlock, for example, in fetuses over 4,000 grams often over predicts the size of the fetus. A study recently was published uh, in 2000. Uh, and 10 uh, by a group, by the author's name is Hart, here you can see it on the, on the slide. And what they did, they did, they took the uh, various Hadlock equations that have been published, they call it Hadlock 1, 2, 3, and 4, and here are the, the, again the differences between the actual and predicted weight. And they modified the equation and found that they had a, uh, a difference of only 3.7 percent. So this is one example, and there are many papers, and there's actually a number of, of of equations that people have used to try and hone in on a better prediction of, of weight using uh, ultrasound parameters. So this, however, is a, is a concern that if you over predict, sometimes you'll, and many times you may say from your ultrasound that the, weight, the fetus is larger than, than it really is. Now another tool that has been identified and been studied and used is estimating the weight using soft tissue analysis. Now what this does this requires a 3D ultrasound probe. And what happens is that the femur is identified and then a sweep is done uh, through the length of the leg. And then in cross sections, as the, as the program identifies slices of the, of the leg accordingly, you then trace the outline of the limb like so, and then come up with a limb volume. And using the bipyridal diameter, the abdominal circumference, and the thigh volume, and this, this is one of the equations that, has been, that have been shown to be useful, one then can predict the weight. And studies have found that using the 3D leg volume has a much more precise assessment of fetal weight than the Hadlock equations have. And so in our, in our clinical practice, as I do this uh, every day in my practice, and I'm asked to, to look at the size of the fetus, estimate the weight, I found that the 3D leg volume is a much better predictor than the Hadlock equation that, that uh, is available. So that's just from our own personal experience. I would concur with the authors of this study published in 2013. But I, I agree clinically from my experience that this is a better tool. Okay. Now the problem is estimating the weight of the fetus remote from term. You've all been perhaps asked to scan a fetus at 40 weeks or 39 weeks, and it's difficult sometimes because of the, of the size and the fact that the head may be deep in the pelvis. And so some authors or several authors have looked at this problem, and they've described it as difficult to measure fetal head and, and abdomen at term to accurately predict the fetal weight. So they came up with a concept which is interesting. And the concept is that they determine the weight a little bit earlier in the third trimester. And then through a calculation, they then adjust it to determine what the weight would be at term. So they, they describe the hypothesis as follows. It's the ratio of the estimated fetal weight of the median fetal weight for gestational age, and it remains constant in the third trimester. And let's see how this is done. I'm going to show you an approach that the authors describe they used to determine the mean weight dated from 1976, and you can use any table you'd prefer that would best estimate the 50th percentile for, for, for newborn weight. Here's what they did. This is actually from fetal growth. 1976, they determined the mean weight 
from 34 to 44 weeks of gestation. So the study that was done, published in 2002, they looked at 133 diabetic patients and 1,690 control patients. Here's the steps they went to, and I'll show you in a graphic in a moment how this is done. They did, the first calculation was the, they determined the ratio between the estimated fetal weight and the median fetal weight for the gestational age using the Brenner curves. Then they took the ratio, multiplied this by the median birth weight at the gestational age of delivery to give the predicted birth weight. And then birth rate errors were determined by the difference between the predicted birth weight and the actual birth weight. Now here's how this is done. So let's assume, for example, at 36 and a half weeks, at 37 weeks, your estimated weight based upon the Hadlock equation, if you're using that, is 3,700 grams. You then, step two, you determine what is the weight, and they use the Brenner curve at 37 weeks, the median weight was 2,870 grams. So you then click, then you calculate the ratio. 3,700 3, divided by 2,870 gives a ratio of 1.29. You then multiply that by the median birth weight at 40 weeks to determine what the estimated weight would be at term. Here is 4231 grams. So this is the concept. This is probably several years ago and other authors have used a, the same concept using different birth weight standards instead of the, the Brenner curve to do the very same thing. And the concept is you can obtain a more accurate measurement because you can visualize the head, the abdomen, the femur better at 37 weeks than you can at 40 weeks. And so this is the concept behind it. And here's that we actually created a little calculator, Excel spreadsheet that actually does this very nicely. So what they found was the diabetic population in predicting macrosomia, the sensitivity using this approach was 68% and the specificity was 96%. The positive predictive value was 97%. The negative predictive value was 87%. So in a diabetic pregnancy, the sensitivity and the specificity and the positive predictive value were quite high. So this is a concept that you may want to take and consider as you scan fetuses sent to you from 36 weeks, say, to 38 weeks. Measure the weight. If you use the Hadlock or the limb volume, you look at the ratio. And if any of you are interested, uh, you can contact uh, me, and I can send you the little calculator that I made for this process. OK, now let's look at the complications of macrosomia, and we're going to look at shoulder dystocia. Let's look at some definitions. American College of OBGYN says the following. Shoulder dystocia is most often an unpredictable and unpreventable obstetric emergency. Failure of the shoulders to deliver spontaneously places both the pregnant woman and the fetus at risk for injury. The definition or the cause is impaction of the anterior shoulder behind the maternal pubic symphysis. Now here is the pubic symphysis. Here's the shoulder. So when the fetus is being delivered, the head comes out and the shoulder gets stuck or gets trapped right here. It also can happen at the posterior shoulder or at, use, at the posterior shoulder can create the problem because there's a problem with the sacral promontory where again it gets stuck. So the shoulder dystocia can, can occur here, the anterior shoulder or the posterior shoulder. Now delivery requires additional obstetric maneuvers following failure of gentle downward traction of the fetal head to affect delivery of the shoulders. And so the obstetrician, though for those of you who are not obstetricians, would apply, apply a little bit of pressure or downward traction of the head to try to allow the shoulder to, to, to negotiate and go below the, uh, the pubic symphysis. Now, when an obstetrician is doing a delivery, there are some clues that he may be getting or she may be getting in the trouble. It's called the turtle sign. If you look right here, here's the turtle sign. You see, obviously, a very large fetal head, large uh, cheeks, and it gets stuck. Of course, this is a nightmare for the obstetrician. Now, the interval of time between the time the head delivers and the body delivers, if it's more than 60 seconds, then that's an indicator that, indeed, the shoulder's dystocia may be occurring. Oops, let me go back here. Okay, the rate of shoulder dystocia. Now, this is interesting. In 1979, this study, they looked at 277,974 vaginal deliveries between 79 and 2003. They found that the rate of shoulder dystocia was 0.2% in 1979 and increased to 2.1% in 2003. There was a tenfold increase in shoulder dystocia that was occurring. 
And here we see a graph showing another study looking at, at a number of deliveries. There's 79,000 deliveries. You can see, again, the trend line is increasing with time. And so you ask the question, why is this happening? Uh, our fetus is bigger, and we're going to see in a moment why that is uh, occurring. Okay, let's look at the factors associated with shoulder dystocia from the study of 79,000 or almost 80,000 vaginal deliveries published in 2007. Here's a table, and we're going to examine each of these results and see what, what, what happens to be relevant. Well, first of all, a BMI of greater than 30, now you know that uh, those of you who watch your weight, you want to become have a BMI of less than 30 because after it hits 30, it's defined as obesity. Uh, now, that, that may be a questionable number, but that's how the definition is. So they look at a BMI of over 30. They found the incidence of shoulder dystocia with moms with a BMI of over 30 was 19% with, uh, actually it was 19% shoulder dystocia. Uh, and the risk for this was 1.64. So if a patient had a BMI of over 30, the risk of shoulder dystocia was increased 1.64 times. Now, why is this occurring? This is a map from 1985. And this represents the states, of course. And the light blue is, is a BMI of less than 10% for the state and between 10 and 14%. I'm going to play this movie. Now, hopefully, the screen uh, will show the change as you can see it. But here we go from 1985. Let's see what happens. Okay, so you see between 1985 to 2010 how the states have changed as far as their rate, their incidence of obesity. And the dark red is over 30% of the population that are obese, and the, uh, the uh, orange 25 to 29%, 20 to 24%. There are no states that are less than 20%. Uh, than the incidence of obesity, here we are in 2000, we had many states that had an obesity level below 20%, and now, as we see, almost every state has a, uh, has a, a, a rate greater than 20%. So the obesity, as we know, has increased in this country. Okay, if one had a birth, uh, birth uh, weight of um, over 4 kilograms, again, the incidence of shoulder dystocia was 62%, the relative risk 5.42. This simply means that if you had a estimated weight of more than uh, four kilograms, the risk of shoulder dystocia would be increased for almost four and a half, five and a half times. Here we have a birth weight of over five, four point five kilos. Now, of course, you can't determine the birth weight prenatally, but this just gives you an idea. This is why this four point five kilo is an important consideration. The risk for shoulder dystocia was increased almost sixteen times. So again, we look also at the clinical factors during labor. There are some values here, there are some indicators, again, of how long the labor lasts. And for those of you who are not obstetricians, this is not so important. But it just tells the OB that if you have a uh, length of certain type parts of the labor that are occurring, the risk increases as the labor is prolonged. OK. Uh, let's now look at 175,000 deliveries in California, published in 1998. The instance of shoulder dystocia was 3%. This is interesting. The Hispanic population, if you're Hispanic, your risk for shoulder dystocia, these are looking at rel rel relative risk, was actually decreased a bit. Induction of labor slightly increased. Diabetes, 1.7. Birth weight over between 4,000 and 4,500 grams, 3.6. Or 4,500 grams, 10. So what, again, the relative risk means if you say to a patient, you're, you have diabetes. Your risk for shoulder dystocia has increased 1.7 times. So these values are helpful, helping us to understand what contributes to these problems. This is another interesting uh, graph that shows the incidence of shoulder dystocia. Here the, here's the weight of the fetus on the x-axis. And so you see as the weight increases, this is for unassisted deliveries, meaning meaning the obstetricians allow, allow the patient to deliver vaginally and to push, and there's no instruments, no forceps, no vacuums, nothing. They just let them deliver uh, as they normally would. And as the weight of the fetus increases, the risk of shoulder dystocia increases. If you were then 
to add to the equation the use of vacuum or forceps that increases the rate of shoulder dystocia. And what this really means is simply that the fetus is not progressing the labor and the doctor uses a vacuum or forceps. Because they're not progressing properly, that just is a clue that there's going to be a risk for shoulder dystocia. If we then look at the diabetic population, we see the same trend, unassisted delivery versus the use of a vacuum or forceps. So again, using an instrument increases the risk of shoulder dystocia. If we now look at unassisted vaginal delivery and compare diabetics and non-diabetics, you see diabetes, again, as we would expect, increases the risk by itself for shoulder dystocia because of larger fetuses. If we look at vacuum and forceps, no diabetes and diabetes, again, the diabetes, again, is a risk factor. If we put them all together, what we see is that unassisted births, as the weight of the fetus increases, the risk increases, but this is lower than if you happen to have uh, if you have diabetes, which is the red line, if you have vacuum or forceps and no diabetes is the blue line, and of course the greatest risk factor is vacuum or forceps with a diabetic patient. So this just gives you some ideas, some relationships. Okay, uh, now this is just a list of what they concluded. Let me just read this uh, fairly uh, quickly. One, the incidence of shoulder dystocia increased with increasing birth weight. 61% of those infants weighing 4,500 grams or greater were delivered vaginally. For each birth weight category, the incidence of shoulder dystocia was increased among infants of diabetic mothers. When forceps or vacuum was used to assist for the delivery, the incidence of shoulder dystocia was increased for each birth weight. When diabetes and assisted vaginal delivery were examined together, their effects on the incidence of shoulder dystocia were nearly equal in additive. Vacuum or forceps assistance carries the same risk for shoulder dystocia. It's about a 250 gram increase in birth weight risk. Diabetes adds an additional 250 gram equivalent to the birth weight risk. In births in which the diagnosis of shoulder dystocia was made, the risk of an adverse neonatal outcome was higher when maternal diabetes was present. The risk of brachial plexus injury increased with diabetes was present. Okay, now let's look at management. Now, I realize that many of you in the audience are not obstetricians, but let me just go through with some graphics and show you what the obstetrician has to consider doing. When the head is not, when the body is not delivered after 60 seconds, the first technique is what's called the McRoberts positioning, where the mother grabs her the thighs and pulls backward, and this is the first maneuver the obstetrician uses. Then suprapubic pressure is applied by a nurse or an attendant to help the obstetrician to try and dislodge the shoulder, and finally they try to deliver the posterior arm by, by rotation or manipulation. Now these are graphics from a, from a ACOG publication called New Natal Brachial Plexus Injury. And here's a stepwise sequence of what, what the obstetrician should do. And this is, again, published in, this, in 2014. It's designed for labor and delivery teams to understand the sequence. For example, first thing is call for help because you're going to need it. Secondly, the McRoberts maneuver of pulling, uh, grabbing the maternal thighs and pulling them backwards, suprapubic pressure, episiotomy, delivering the posterior arm, rotation, et cetera, et cetera. So all these things are, are to be executed in a, in a timely sequence. Now, because the movie that I have here doesn't really play well on a webinar, I'm not going to show it, but this is just a demonstration that is used to teach medical students or residents the maneuvers used to try and do the steps I've just mentioned. Okay, and this is a, a sheet that ACOG recommends be filled out when indeed a shoulder dystocia is present to document what occurred. We'll see why this is important in a few minutes. Okay, now let's go back and ask how can we predict adverse outcome? And we're going to now look at some ultrasound pro tools other than the estimated fetal weight to show you how this is done. The first is called the cheek-to-cheek -cheek diameter. This is published in first in 1991, and what the authors did, they measured the diameter of the cheek from one cheek to the other. Here we see the lips and the, and the nostrils. And if you have a difficult time getting the other side of the cheek because the face is down, simply measure the diameter from the middle of the nose to the cheek, and then double that by two, and then you will get the cheek-to-cheek -cheek diameter. And they found that the diameter increased as a function of gestational age. And here's a graph illustrating the, the diameter increasing as a function of gestational age. What they found was they then took the diameter divided by the BPD. They created a ratio. They found that 
In predicting a large for gestational age, gestational age diabetic, the ratio that they used, and they have it set for different ages, they identified 90% of the fetuses who were LGA and diabetic. And LGA non-diabetic, 72%, and AGA diabetic, 63%. So it was very helpful in identifying the fetus that had a had diabetes and was large for gestational age. Here again are the are the ratios that they use based upon the age of the fetus. This is the 95th percentile. Excuse me, it's two standard deviations above the mean. And what they found in a study, they looked at. Whoops, let me go back here. They looked at a retrospective group and a prospective group. And this is the instance of complicated deliveries. And what they found was as follows. They ultimately found that if the and they used in this final study the cheek to cheek diameter. If it was more than 7.9 centimeters, it was closely associated with an increased risk for cesarean delivery, regardless of the estimated fetal weight. At term, the risk for cesarean section with a cheek to cheek diameter greater than 7.9 centimeters was 94%. Had a, so, this is a very important uh, concept. It had a 40% sensitivity, but when it was abnormal, had a 97% specificity for detecting the fetus that would require a C-section because of failure to progress in labor. So a very simple tool to consider using. Another tool is the abdominal diameter minus the BPD diameter. And this is a study. The hypothesis was asymmetric distribution of fetal weight may predispose to fetal shoulder dystocia. So the authors in 2007, they said, okay, let's look at this. 322 patients, 23 of 32 had shoulder dystocia, abdominal diameter, BPD diameter. And they, their criteria for the study was uh, they measured the, diam the, the diameters, estimated weight greater than 97th percentile, and abdominal circumference greater than 95th percentile. And the person who had diabetes who had shoulder dystocia was 39.1% and no shoulder dystocia, 17.5. And birth weight, we see here shoulder dystocia and no shoulder dystocia. And the diameter, mean the abdominal diameter minus the BPD, this is the incidence, and here's what they found. If you compare all the tools, an abdominal diameter minus the BPD diameter greater than 2.6 centimeters, had a sensitivity of 44%, a specificity of 90%, and a predictive value of 7.15. Compared to abdominal circumference, compared to estimated fetal weight, and a weight of more than 4,000 grams, this was the best predictor compared to these other tools. So, so this is something very easy to do, and it may be worth considering as you plan assessing a fetus that you think is at risk for macrosomia. Even though you have used these tools for quite some time, consider this, this approach is very simple to take and do. And, uh, uh, then here's the likelihood ratio, again, a high likelihood ratio of 4.44 using this concept. Let's talk about brachial plexus injury because this is the concept or this is the, one of the major problems that a fetus who is macrosomic, who has shoulder dystocia and has trauma at birth, uh, this is what results. And it shows, again, that brachial plexus injuries have increased over time. This has been a function, of course, of the increasing uh, maternal weight and the increased risk of shoulder dystocia. Herbis palsy has, there's several definitions. I won't go into those um, in great detail, but bottom line is a child who has this injury can have no arm movement, a bent arm, uh, no startle reflex, decreased grip. And here's some an images of children who have it. Notice here the abnormality. Here's the, the arm, uh, the arm. The arm. So again, these are complications that, if they persist, have a lifetime of, of, of problems. Now, I have again, I had a video, but it doesn't play well, so I'm not going to show it. But it was an interview with a young girl from England who is a teenager. She describes the difficulty of having Herbis palsy as a child and now as a young adult, and all the complications, all the problems, and it's a very, um, a very uh, it's a very touching video. And during when she did the podcast and, and described the issues she had, the young people who had Herbis palsy were, were writing in or had written commentary 
about what she was saying, and it, it was really uh, a heart rendering to hear their stories and their difficulties. Now, a spin on this is the legal community. Here we see, for example, this is one advertisement, uh, and we see uh, Boston Herbs Palsy Lawyers. Uh, nationwide client service and neurological birth injury litigation. This is a huge area for plaintiff attorneys to identify uh, children who have suffered from this condition and then to seek out the reasons why this happened and, and to go after the obstetrician. Another uh, advertisement here in New York City, Herb's palsy. Herb's palsy is caused by excessive traction of the baby's head by the delivering doctor. Children diagnosed with herbs palsy are going to have permanent loss of function and pain in the affected arm. And so, again, they're going after the physician who delivered this child for problems. Okay, predicting risk for shoulder stoshi with adverse neonatal outcome. I'm going to share with you now a tool that we use in our practice, uh, and I'll try to explain the how this evolved, how it's used. Uh, the tool that I'm going to discuss with you. Um, has been used primarily by large insurance carriers in which they blanket all the obstetricians who are under their insurance arm. And this, is, uh, this has been done primarily on the East Coast. And so the obstetricians on every patient goes through a, an, an algorithm to identify their risk for shoulder stoshis. I'm going to show you the concept behind this, how it's used, and then a recent study showing the effect of, of, of the study in the paper was published um, in 2006. It was titled Prediction of Risk for Shoulder Stocia with Neonatal Injury. They had 498 cases of shoulder stocia and they had 622 controls. And so their injury, they found brachial plexus injury was 72%, clavicular or humeral fracture was 31%, and cephalopathy was 3.3%. So these are the injuries that they identified. In this, in this study. And what they found that the model that best predicted shoulder dystocia included short mothers, large babies, obesity, and diabetes. So these are the parameters that seem to take and pop out that were risk factors. And what they did, they developed an algorithm and a way of assessing this. And the, the equation, I, I get lost after the third part of this equation here. But basically, they have <clears throat> identified these groups of patients and found that groups who fell in, and the, what's called a modal score here, fell in this group with a vaginal delivery had a shoulder stocia instance of 92.6%. So from this study, they then said, okay, with this number of, of significant shoulder stocia cases with, with adverse outcome or injury, this would be equivalent to looking at a population of 2.2 million vaginal births. And so from this, from this data, they then created, um, <clears throat> or they looked at the variables that, that affected or predicted adverse outcome from shoulder dystocia. And here we see what we have between the two groups. <clears throat> Diabetes, maternal height that was, that was short, maternal weight that was increased, maternal BMI, birth weight, and of course, babies that were born that were large. And this is a form now that the obstetrician in, who are part of insurance carriers that, that offer this program, the patient fills out a form, the OB fills out a form, name, ID, et cetera, and asks, answers these questions at 36 to 37 weeks to 38 to 39 weeks. They answer yes or no, yes or no, yes or no. And then they come up with a risk score. And if the risk score is increased, then they counsel the patient. And so it flows something like this. An office visit, 36 to 37 weeks. They conduct the shoulder screen, uh, screen that I talked about. They estimate the fetal weight. And here's the big question I'll come back to in a moment. And if it's low risk, they don't do anything. If it's high risk or intermediate risk, then they have a conversation, discuss it with them. Let me show you how this is done. Now, what happened? I, I came across this program when I attended Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine meeting several years ago. And this was discussed in a presentation, <clears throat> and I contacted the people who make this. And I said, I would like to use this in the clinical environment because I'm always asked a question on a pretty much a daily basis 
does this fetus have a risk for shoulder dystocia? Well, you know, you use the different tools we talked about. So this is a program that I've used, and I'll show you how it works. You fill out the information, uh, the weight, the BMI, the age of the, of the fetus, the time of the examination, the estimated weight. And what I've been doing is I've been using the Hadlock equation and the limb volume equation, and then identifying uh, which, you know, the risk factors based on both, and I then counsel the physician as to which weight estimate I feel is the most appropriate, and for the most part, it's the limb volume equation. But here you see the program allows you to take and predict at the time of the examination if the risk is higher or not. So this is an intermediate risk zone, high risk zone, and 14 days later, a high risk zone. So you then would discuss with the patient the findings. So let's take and see what you might say. You do the examination, you estimate the weight, you do the calculation, and it says she's in a high risk zone. So then you might have a discussion that says the risk for shoulder dystocia with a permanent brachial plexus injury is 15 times higher than the background risk. The risk for shoulder dystocia with any brachial plexus injury is 8.4 times higher than the background risk. And so this, these numbers come from the analysis that is performed. So it gives you these, these ratios and these values. So here we have somebody who's an intermediate risk zone. Okay, you'd have the same conversation with them. The risk for shoulder dystocia with permanent brachial plexus injury is 2.2 times higher than the background risk. The risk for shoulder dystocia with any brachial plexus injury is 2.5 times higher than the background risk. So again, we have a discussion with them. And the same thing, here's low risk, and so you would say your risk is, is quite low and have that same discussion. So once you've done that, well, actually, the, the conclusions were from the study were the following. The risk for brachial plexus injury with permanent injury can now be quantified, or can now be, it should be quantified, not I quantified. The healthcare provider and patient can now be provided with information regarding the risk of brachial plexus injury, together make a decision regarding the method of delivery. The patient signs a consent form for delivery management. This may protect the physician from future litigation should an adverse outcome occur. So this is the concept. You Estimate the weight with ultrasound, the best tool that you have to use. And again, I find that limb volume is a better predictor. You compute the risk. You then advise the patient. Now, this is a study published in 2012 looking at this approach. And let's see what they found. Uh, I'm, I'm going to write to this point right here. The classification of patients, 86.1% uh, were classified as low risk, you know, 10% one intermediate risk and 3.7% high risk. So the high risk group was not a, was about actually the incidence of shoulder dystocia in the population and that was about 3%. Now, they found from using this approach, there was no change in the C-section the rate, but the shoulder dystocia rate fell by 56% when the physicians acted upon you, this information that was provided in this tool. Okay, so let's summarize, summarize with this slide. I understand that most of you probably don't have the tool that I just explained. So let's take and go through some options that you might want to consider when you're scanning a fetus and the risk is, is or they're, they're sent to for risk for shoulder stocia or large fetus. Well, first, predicting birth weight. You have option number one. At 34 to 37 weeks, you can do the gestation adjusted projection for birth weight. Remember what I said you do? You simply estimate the weight, take the ratio between that weight and the mean weight for that gestational age, then go out to the weeks of gestation you want to consider, which for example is 40 weeks, multiply the weight expected at 40 weeks for the mean times the ratio you just computed, then you'll determine what the size will be at 40 weeks. And so this is how you can estimate the, ri the risk for macrosomia when you scan the fetus between 37, 34 and 37 weeks of gestation. The other approach, which happens unfortunately in my practice more often than not, the patient sent to me 38 to 39 weeks. And the question is, how big is the fetus? So we have two options. Hadlock equation, which can overestimate the weight uh, by as much as 8.4%, or the limb volume equation, which I prefer using because uh, we have the tools to do so, and that has a, a less of an error in predicting the weight of the fetus and the risk for macrosomia. So once you've done that, then you may 
as you consult with the obstetrician if you provide sonography services. You may then say, this is the incidence or this is the, the, uh, the probability of having a fetus with macrosomia and you, give, you provide the physician the estimated weight and then they decide clinically what they want to do with that information. Now the biggest problem I've seen and I've unfortunately done some medical legal cases is that when this is done and the question is asked, the sonographer, the, the physician who's responsible for the sonographer or who's doing this exam themselves, they don't image the structures properly. And they often, I've seen, when the, when the weight has been underpredicted, not overpredicted, underpredicted, the plane through the abdominal circumference, which is used in the measurement, is in, inaccurate. And I've seen several cases where that was done improperly and the results in litigation were that they, were, they paid a, a hefty price for making that mistake. So you have to be very careful when you obtain these images used in the weight calculation that you do it correct, correctly and accurately, especially with the abdominal circumference. Okay, so then the question is, after you've determined that, you may say that you have a, an estimated weight that is not by definition by ACOG, quote-unquote macrosomia, but the fetus is large, then you may want to consider looking at the cheek-to-cheek -cheek diameter, and if it's more than two standard deviations above the mean, you may want to say the risk for cesarean section for failure to progress in labor is, is increased. You may want to provide that information to your to the people that uh, who refer you uh, fetuses to examine. And finally, if you do the abdominal diameter minus the BPD diameter, it's more than 2.6 centimeters, then you may consider the possibility of an increased risk for shoulder dystocia um, uh, at the time of the delivery. And finally, if you have access to the software program that I talked about, this is also a unique tool. So in conclusion, what I've tried to do is lay a foundation for you uh, that uh, helps you understand uh, macrosomia, uh, shoulder dystocia, and here this slide summarizes some tools that are available. And if you look at the references, uh, they're available when you, when you uh, if you look at this, this talk and as it's recorded, and use these references and review these papers, it may be very helpful to you to get your arms around this problem and come up with an approach that could be useful as you uh, counsel and provide information to referring obstetricians uh, for the fetuses that you, that you examine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. DeVore. And it looks like we have several questions from the audience. Are you able to see them? I am. Uh, let me see what we have here. Okay. Why is question one? Why is there increased incidence of shoulder dystocia with assisted delivery? Is it that assistance is used more frequently as a consequence of shoulder dystocia? The answer is this. When the well, there's probably two answers. One is many times the obstetrician who's doing the delivery, the fetus is not progressing as it should in the last part of, of, the, of the labor process. And because of not knowing how large the fetus really is, they put on forceps or a vacuum and attempt to assist in the delivery and lo and behold, the fetus is larger than they anticipated and they get trapped and they have a shoulder stosha from that. Okay. Next question. Do all of the risk factors have to be present for a baby to be at risk for shoulder stosia? Short mom, diabetes. Good, very good question. Not necessarily. What I've seen, for example, in using the computerized analysis that I talked about, uh, various factors, they interplay with each other. For example, you can have uh, a, tall, a taller mom with uh, a larger fetus, but she has diabetes, and that would then uh, place her perhaps at higher risk. Or you have a mom that has a fetus that has an estimated fetal weight, say, uh, 4,200 grams. It's not by definition macrosomia, but she's five foot one, and she has diabetes, and that she pops out as having an increased risk. So it's, a, it's putting all the factors together, and they play differently depending on the combinations. That's what's nice about the program, because it looks at the interaction between these factors and gives you a risk. Our moms with cerebral palsy, at, at a higher risk of posterior shoulder dystocia due to prominent sacral promontory. And moms with cerebral palsy. 
so moms with cerebral palsy at higher risk. Um, I'm not sure that the the mom with cerebral palsy would have a higher risk unless anatomically she has a prominent sacral promontory. Um, so I, I'm not quite sure uh, how to answer that other than if the mother has physical changes because of cerebral palsy that would increase the, or decrease the distance uh, between the uh, pubic symphysis and sacral promontory, then if that's a result of that, then that would increase it. Okay, any other questions? Looks like we have one more, Dr. DeVore. Like we have one more, Dr. DeVore. Okay, let me look. I see it here popping up. How can we get a copy or gain access to the PERICOM program algorithm? How can we get a copy of the handout of your presentation? Okay, the PERICOM program is a program that 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 I that you subscribe to. You there's a price to be paid, uh, and so you would contact the PERICOM company and ask them what the cost would be. Uh, I pay I pay a fee every year to use it, and and the reason I do so is because I have a large practice. Uh, I scan probably about 45 OB. 45 fetuses a day, and so this comes up all the time. I just, it's like uh, anything else, you, you pay, pay a fee for it. A copy of the handout of my presentation, um, if you email me uh, at grdevore at gmail.com, I'll spell that for you, g-r-d-e-v-o-r-e -E at gmail.com, I'd be happy to send you a PDF of the presentation. Okay. Uh, any association between prominent subcutaneous fat and macrosomia? Yes, there is, and this is why the limb volume equation um, that I use is so important because what happens, you can have a fetus with a large abdomen and normal subcutaneous fat, and the headlock equation will overpredict the weight. But it, and by the same token, you have a fetus that has maybe a high normal abdominal circumference, but a lot of subcutaneous fat, you'll underestimate the weight. So the two are related, and this is why the, the limb volume equation is so useful because it takes that into to account that you cannot measure any other way. Uh, now those of you who happen to have current 3D, 4D ultrasound machines from the various manufacturers, all of them, the three major companies that make these machines, have this equation and its ability to estimate the weight built into the system. So you may want to contact uh, your applications uh, people for the company if you have a machine and have them show you how to take and use this because it is in their machines. Okay, another question. Does the fetal liver volume predict fetal macrosomia? Um, it may. Certainly, as you look at the structures in the, in the fetus that are increased when you have a larger abdomen, the liver makes up a, a huge portion of that abdominal circumference that you're measuring. Um, certainly, to measure the liver volume on each patient would be problematic, but I think the concept um, of a larger liver certainly is associated with macrosome because the liver does increase in size, and that's the main structure in the, in, at the level of the abdominal circumference that you see that is increased uh, when, that, when that abdomen is large. And it looks like that might be the end of the looks question. Like that might be the end of the questions. Okay, let me just repeat my email one more time for those who may want to take and uh, have a copy. Uh, it's G. G like George, R Devore at gmail.com. And again, if uh, any of you would like this, I'm happy to take and respond and send you the PDF of the slides. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Devore. Well, that so was much, a uh, great lecture. And I think to all of you who participated today, all... everyone, please remember to complete the post test and the activity evaluation. We hope you enjoyed the presentation and will join us again for future webinars. So long, everybody. Have a great weekend.